Okay, I think we're good to go. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Jane Gregory from Oxford University. She's a clinical psychologist and she's going to discuss her work on the prevalence of misophonia. Take it away, Jane. Great. Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks for having me. And thanks, everyone, for coming. It looks like we've got a, a good number of people here watching. I'm really happy that people are so interested in the science. It's really great. Um, I'm just going to share my screen for the presentation. And hopefully, this will go seamlessly. Okay, there we go. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about the prevalence of misophonia. Now, some of you may have uh, seen in the, there was a bit of a flurry of press activity saying that uh, nearly one in five people have misophonia. And this was research that came from myself and my colleague Celia Vitarachu, who is at King's College London. And so I'm going to talk about how we came to that number and also the seeming contradiction of um, people feeling like nobody understands misophonia. And yet, how is that possible when it's so many people, if so many people have it? So I'll just a uh, little plan for today. So Jennifer's already done an introduction, so I won't go too much in, uh, into about me. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about the um, the way we measure the complexity of misophonia with a questionnaire that we developed, and and then looking at that, comparing the people with misophonia with the general population on that questionnaire, and then I'll talk about how we got to the prevalence of misophonia, and a bit about why it's possible that so many people don't understand, even though so many people have it, and a bit about future directions. This is just to show you my beautiful, beautiful university. And if you're wondering, oh, that's me in the library there, glaring at somebody for clicking their pen too loudly. Um, I also have misophonia and uh, pen clicking is one that goes all the way back to school for me. And um, the, my own experience with misophonia is what drove me to start doing research. So I'm a clinical psychologist by background and now researching it at Oxford University. And I just want to acknowledge uh, my research is specifically funded by the Wellcome Trust. And the project that I'm going to talk about today was carried out at King's College uh, with Celia Vitaratu as the lead researcher on that and our amazing research assistants, Nora and Chloe, who have been with us working on this for years now. And they're, they're all funded by NAHR um, at King's College. And just a quick disclosure that I do have some things that I receive a bit of income for in relation to misophonia. Okay, so starting off, where, where, why did we look at this general population? Why did we look at the prevalence? And where did we start from? So this is the S5. It's a questionnaire we developed a few years ago trying to capture the complexity of misophonia. We knew both of us, Celia and myself, both have misophonia and we knew that it was more than just, I don't like sounds and we wanted to capture that. So we did questionnaires with thousands of people with misophonia and these were the five key themes that came out of it. And this is our, our questionnaire captures these five themes. So this idea of externalizing, this feeling like the other person is the one who's doing something wrong. It's bad manners. You just shouldn't make these sounds. Then we've got internalizing, which is feeling like there's something wrong with me that I react this way to sounds. Then we've got this sense of threat, an emotional sense of threat. So feeling trapped, feeling helpless or distressed when you're around these sounds or if you can't get away from them. We had outbursts, which actually for most people is a fear that you might be aggressive. Um, and for some people, there is some verbal and occasionally physical aggression, but mostly it's people fearing that that will happen. And finally, the impact or limitations of misophonia. So this is specifically the things that you are not able to do because of misophonia. So just have a quick look at what that looks like in a big group of people with misophonia. And as you can see, this one here, the threat variable, that, that seems to be the key feature here. It's, it's an average score of 45 out of 50 in our misophonia group. So that's where this research started. We wanted to take this into the general population and see if we could find out what was going on there. So we're going to have a look now at comparing the general population with people with misophonia. So what we did was we did an online survey with 772 people, and this is in the UK. We used a service that gives us what we call a representative sample, which is means that it, it roughly represents the population of the UK in terms of age, gender, and ethnicity. We just have a 
quick look at the back at the questionnaire. So the, the, the pink is the misophonia population and this sort of blue gray color is the UK general population. And we're really interested to see that externalizing was only one and a half times higher in the general population, whereas all the other four areas were three to four times higher. So actually it's quite normal for people in the general population also to feel like other people should just behave themselves and um, make fewer of these noises. But the, everything else in misophonia is much more of a unique experience to somebody with misophonia, that feeling of trapped and helpless and not being able to do things because of misophonia. So then our next question was, okay, now that we've got this general population, how many of them do we think have misophonia? The way we did that was we took our 772 people and we selected a, a range of people from that group. And we had 29 from that general population and then another 26 who had were um, identified as having misophonia. And we did online clinical interviews with them and they were with psychologists who were experienced in working with people with misophonia from those interviews. We then uh, came to a, a conclusion at the end of the interview whether we thought that they met the criteria for misophonia. And I'll talk a little bit about subclinical and clinical misophonia uh, in a moment, but this included both subclinical and clinical. So 25 we thought had misophonia and 30 didn't. And then Celia, who's a statistician, um, she used her very, very fancy maths. That's not her maths, that's just, <laughs> just representing the fancy maths. And she used that to create a cutoff score on that S5 questionnaire, which tells us if someone scores over 87, we think they're quite likely to have misophonia. And if they're under 87, then they're not likely to have misophonia. And that's just an estimate based on how they fill in the questionnaire. And from that, we then took that back to that big general population sample, the 772 people. And we were able to then see how many were of 87 and how many were under 87. And we had 18% were um, above the cutoff for misophonia. So that's nearly one in five people were above the cutoff. Then we wanted to know, is it more common in uh, men or women? And this was a really important question to us because a lot of the research before had been overrepresented with women and we didn't know if that's because women were more likely to have misophonia or if it's just that they were more likely to take part in research on misophonia. So we uh, had a look at the distribution and we found that there was no difference between men and women in the prevalence of misophonia. But we did interestingly find that there was an effect of age. So people as they got older tended to have slightly lower scores on the um, overall misophonia severity. And we don't know if that's because misophonia gets better over time or if it's just that people have much better coping strategies over time and therefore it affects them less. So the big question, if there's that many people with misophonia, how is it that it's still so, so misunderstood? Why do people still not know what we're talking about when we talk about our misophonia? So the first reason is most people still haven't heard of it. At the time we did this survey, only 14% of that general population sample were familiar with the term misophonia. And this was a, a couple of years ago, so we hope that it's improving. Um, but there was a similar study in the US, um, Laura Dixon, who found that only 11% in that US sample um, recognized what misophonia was. So that's, um, again, not, not much awareness of the term. So that's one reason why people don't understand. They haven't heard of it and therefore it must not exist. Another reason is that most people, 85% of people said they didn't like the sound of loud chewing. So this is something that people can relate to. And therefore, they assume if they if they can deal with it, you must you should be able to deal with it too. So th this is another theory as to why people don't understand. But what we know is that the reaction, the nature of the reaction is really different in people with misophonia compared to the general population. So if we have a look here, we asked them what the, what the emotional reaction was to the sound of loud chewing. And in the general population, you can see here, irritation and disgust were the most common responses to loud chewing. But in the misophonia population, it was anger and panic. And you can see here that anger was by far the, the biggest, most um, frequently reported reaction. So the nature of the reaction is really different, but because people can relate to the idea of not liking this sound, they assume that that's what you mean and therefore you should just deal with it the way that they do. We also know 
from the S5 that it's not just about the emotional reaction. It's all of this as well. It's feeling like there's something wrong with you. It's feeling like you will be overwhelmed or something will happen if you can't get away from these sounds and it's not being able to do things you want to do because of sounds. Another reason is that we included subclinical misophonia. Now, subclinical, this is a very, very uh, therapy kind of term, but basically we, we would consider a disorder to be subclinical if somebody meets all the criteria for that disorder, except that on a day-to-day -day basis, it doesn't cause significant distress. It doesn't interfere with their life on a day-to-day -day basis. So for misophonia, that means that they would have that kind of threat reaction that if they were stuck in a room with a sound, they would feel out of control, they would feel overwhelmed, they would need to get away from that sound. But on a day to day basis, it's not affecting them that greatly. So that means that in that one in five number, even people with misophonia might not be able to understand what you're going on. They might not be able to relate to your level of suffering. So that's another reason why we might feel so misunderstood that other people who have that same experience with sounds think that they can relate to what you're talking about, but because they're not suffering at the same level, actually they don't understand, but they think they do, and therefore there's that disconnect. Now I'm just going to talk really quickly about some limitations of this study. So there's no formal diagnostic criteria. Um, in the, the previous session, uh, Zach was mentioning that there is now a, a definition of misophonia based on what we know at the moment, but we still don't have a di diagnostic criteria, which is where you would say, if you tick all these boxes, then we can say you do or don't have misophonia. So we base this on our clinical judgment on two clinicians who were experienced with misophonia, but we had our, our, our own concept of what misophonia was. And this was only in the UK, so it, it, we can only apply that to the UK, and we didn't do any comparisons based on ethnicity. So and Britain is 80% um, white, so it's probably not a very good um, number to, to generalise to other um, cultural groups. So therefore, this 18%, it's an estimate, and it's an estimate based on where the research is at right now, where our understanding of misophonia is right now. So it could be that that number changes over time as we learn more about misophonia, and particularly once we as professionals come to an agreement about how we would diagnose misophonia. But it's a promising um, finding that there was a similar study in the US, and this was a questionnaire-based study with 1,400 people where they used a, a screening tool um, to categorize people as having clinical, subclinical, or no misophonia. And similar to ours, when you combine the clinical and subclinical, it came up with 17%. So it's really similar number to our 18%. So it looks like when, when you include subclinical misophonia, this one in five um, may be a, a good estimate based on how we currently understand misophonia. But this was done by questionnaire. So this number of, the, of clinical misophonia, we would need to do sort of more in-depth clinical interviews to assess whether that's, that's a good estimate um, of 7% having clinical misophonia. So I'll just quickly sum up. So we think at, around, at the moment there's around 18% of people have some form of misophonia. We know that from our study it was roughly equal men and women and that it got a little bit less severe with time or um, with, as people got older. We can see that there are a few reasons that have just come out of just this one study to, to see why it might be so misunderstood. And, and part of that is people thinking they understand when actually the misophonic experience is really different from not liking sounds. And we assume that the subclinical experience of misophonia is quite different from the clinical um, experience of misophonia. So we've got more work ahead of us and just uh, to talk about what we're going to be doing in our team. We're hoping to improve this questionnaire because we, we designed those <laughs> items and, and first surveyed people a few years ago now and we've learned a lot in the last few years about misophonia. We hope that we can use that then to estimate how many of the population have clin a clinical level of misophonia, what we would consider to be a disorder, the sorts of people who might be looking for help and support for their misophonia. And then importantly, we'd like to look at the difference between clinical misophonia and subclinical misophonia so that we can understand for the people most in need of help and support, what are the key things there that we can use to understand clinical misophonia? And then they might be the sorts of things that we could target with um, 
treatment. And finally, what predicts changes in misophonia over time? We saw that it got a little bit uh, less severe with age and we'd really like to understand what's going on there and again we can use that to help develop and refine treatments that might be able to help people to improve their misophonia we're not optimistic for a total cure or anything but um, at least to sort of bring down that intensity that especially that feeling of threat that um, sense of feeling trapped and helpless in response to sounds so that's what we're working on um, now at oxford and king's college and that is almost exactly my 15 minutes up. Thank you for listening. I also just want to say thank you um, for everyone who's taken part in our research, all the patients that have come through our clinic in Oxford and everyone, especially the admins of the social media groups, because I've learned so much from them and they've been really supportive of, of all of our work. Here's some places you can follow me. And I do have a book coming out just a quick plug for that coming out in september with bloomsbury and it's available for pre-order and this is pretty much everything i've learned about misophonia as well as a bit about my own experience and some strategies that people can try for misophonia that's coming out um, in september and that's me thank you very much dr gregory that was just perfect timing so we have one question that came in and as I'm going over this question, if everybody wants to start using the chat for their questions, that would be great. So one person wanted to know if the people in your study who had misophonia knew they had misophonia or, you know, had heard of it before the study. That's a great question. So the for the interviews, the people who um, were in that group of 26 people with self-identified misophonia they came to us because they identified as having misophonia but in the bigger group the 18 percent actually there were only two percent of that entire group who said yes I'm, I'm fairly sure i have misophonia so we based on their answers to the questions we thought they were likely to have misophonia but most of those people hadn't actually heard the term or or weren't aware that it applied to their particular symptoms and that's i think a, a, a big key point in terms of raising awareness so that people do find this term to explain their experiences. Thank you. The next question, is there evidence of misophonia being progressive? And let me go on a little bit more in terms of what this person wrote. So is it progressive? Is there any insight for improving from clinical to subclinical? And are, is it possible that someone could grow out of misophonia? Okay, so the the answer to the first part, is there any evidence of this? Not in research. That's not something that has specifically been studied, but there's um, anecdotal evidence for some people that it gets worse over time and for some people that it gets better, but actually mostly it sort of goes up and down that during times of transition, times of stress, or times where there's an increase in noise around you, understandably your misophonia would be worse in those times. I think that statistic where we found that it sort of got slightly less severe with age, it could be that it um, improves over time, but it could also be that as you get older, you have much more control over your environment and you can find more solutions with time that work for you. So it could just be less of an impact of misophonia if you remember that it, uh, in those five areas one of them was the limitations and impact of misophonia if you've built your life in a way that means it doesn't affect you so much your score are a bit lower on that scale the other score that might come down a little bit is that internalizing of blaming yourself for the way you react to sounds if over time you sort of come to terms with misophonia and, and understand misophonia that's one of the first things that improves in therapy is that internalizing factor that feeling like there's something wrong or broken inside me because I react this way to sounds. And that's certainly one area that we would want to improve with treatment. And I think if you if you focus on those areas in treatment, that's one way to move from clinical to subclinical is finding really great coping strategies, blaming yourself less and learning how to talk about it and negotiate with the people around you to um, have an environment that is more um, sustainable. OK, thank you. Another question is, is this survey available to the public? Yes, it is. Um, I will see how I can share the, the link. The, our, the 
the paper, the, the actual published paper, that there's the actual questionnaire is included in that published paper and we are putting up an online version through King's College. If you follow um, S5 on, I think it's on all the social media places, um, you can ask questions there and we can send you in that direction to find the survey as well. Okay, do we have any other questions? We'll just pause a moment. I can see there's just an, another question there. Someone's asked about volunteering for studies in the UK. Thank you. Yes, please do volunteer for studies in the UK. Uh, on my website, sounds like misophonia.com, I have a, a research participant list. I will, um, when I'm doing my next round of data collection, I'll be sending out an email to that email list. So if you'd like to sign up there, you'll get a notification. We'll be collecting some more um, survey data later this year. I apologize. I was. I'm just learning how to use this chat. Um, there, there are some more questions. So, um, one attendee is asking, or saying rather, that misophonia seemed to be much more widely known in the 1990s, especially in films such as Train Spotting, uh, where someone attacks somebody for opening a crisp packet. Interesting. Uh, in addition, she is citing Zazu's reaction to the chalkboard sound with Scar. I don't remember the movie that well, but okay. Also, the Grinch hating everyone. It was all changed in the recent remakes of those two films. Has it been stamped out of films in Hollywood? We're asking Jane in the UK. Um, um, well, uh, that's that's really interesting. So, I mean, I think it's it's always existed. We just didn't have a term for it in the past, and so that that makes sense that it like in pop culture that it would be represented in terms of how people react. I have no idea why those things were removed from the remake. I I, I don't know if that's any particular. I don't know that there's anything specific to read into that. And what I'm noticing is it actually being mentioned more by name in pop culture now and i think that that's a really helpful thing and I, and I think it's really helpful that it gets represented in lots of different ways in pop culture as well and the more that the, the word gets put out there i think the, the more people will learn that there is an explanation for what they're experiencing thank you another question you mentioned no formal diagnostic criteria was that just for this study or for the entire field we created our own criteria well no, we didn't create it entirely there there was a proposed diagnostic criteria from uh, the research team in amsterdam at the amsterdam medical center and we adapted that based on the way that we work in the uk so there were just some slight tweaks to that diagnostic criteria but what i meant by that is that there's nothing that's been done by consensus so what you would usually do to come up with the di diagnostic criteria is work with a big range of professionals and people with the disorder to come up with an agreed criteria. So we used a, a criteria so that we could say whether we thought somebody did or didn't have misophonia for our study, but there isn't a, an agreed upon one globally. Okay, thank you. Another question. You very briefly referenced the fact that people might build their lives in such a way that they avoid triggers. Do you see people with moderate to severe misophonia who do just that? build a life that is relatively trigger free. Would you recommend trying to do that? I would recommend trying to do that temporarily. I don't think it's a permanent solution to have your entire life organized around it. And I think that there is some value in working out ways to get along with sound so that your life isn't limited. It's, it's about finding a balance between being able to cope and do things um, but also not missing out on, on too much as a result so if doing that means that you miss out on a lot of things that are really important to you then actually what I'm hoping is that over time we'll develop treatments that will enable you to be able to continue to, to live your life I think that if you build your life and I, I have spoken to a couple of people who moved to very very quiet places in an attempt to escape sounds and what they found was it was just smaller sounds that would bother them so then suddenly it would be the birds outside instead of the neighbors upstairs so i i'm not sure that you can really escape misophonia unfortunately we're at 10 minutes till the end okay so good thank you chris so 
another question. Are typically loud sounds considered in research? Uh, this person goes on, I see many references to soft sounds, but it seems people react differently to loud sounds, non-human sounds than me. That's a great question. So with loud sounds, um, it's it's a bit harder to distinguish between misophonia and uh, another condition called hyperacusis. And hyperacusis is specifically where your tolerance for sounds over a certain volume is much lower than other people's, and that that can actually be tested by an audiologist. They've got they've got a test that specifically. Um, finds what that tolerance point is and for people with hyperacusis they actually hear those sounds as being louder than they actually are once they're above a certain volume whereas with misophonia it's more about either the pattern of the sound so sort of a repetitive sound or the particular meaning of that sound um, and that could be a conscious meaning of the sound like how dare you make that disgusting noise in front of me or it could be um, a, a less conscious thing just where your brain has kind of associated that sound for some reason with um, being a problem and so it could yeah so loud sounds can also be part of misophonia but if someone is only re reacting to loud sounds, you would probably be looking more in the direction of hyperacusis. I've, I've forgotten the rest of the question. I hope that answered it. I, I think you did. Oh, we did have things like car engines and um, leaf blowers and things like that. So we did include some, some loud sounds, but things that would also sort of be considered like nuisance noise. Okay, thank you. Another question. As I age, I acquire new triggers. The distress is as intense as it ever was. Will you be collecting data on new trigger acquisition? That I, I would love to. What I would love to do is keep following up with people over time so that we can capture this information. So I, I did a, another study, which isn't the one I talked about today, but it was another general population study two years ago. And I'm about to ask all of those people again um, how many <laughs> triggers they are, how intense their reactions are, and also all of those questions about um, on the S5, the things about internalizing, externalizing, and then see if we can work out if there's any way to predict wh how the, whether these things go up and down and whether there are any particular things that contribute to it going up and down. So that's something that I'm really, really interested in, especially because for some people it, they acquire triggers and for other people the triggers drop off and we don't know why. Thank you. Another question. Is there a way to measure misophonia sounds in terms of their sound properties, such as transient strength above a certain frequency threshold? Oh, I probably am not the right person to answer that question. It's not something that we're doing in our research. I, I suspect some people in the more neuroscience-y realm might be able to answer that question for you. There are people who are looking specifically at the kind of acoustic properties of the sound i'm we we found that we had a list of 37 sounds that we asked people about and we found that they clustered into three different groups one was general uh, generally eating sounds another one was nose and throat sounds so sniffing repetitive coughing throat clearing that kind of thing and the third category was um, environmental sounds and when i say clustered together that means that if you said this sound is intense for me, then you're probably more likely to say another sound from that category is also intense for you. So what I'm interested in is trying to work out what joins those things together. Is it that they're joined together by the acoustic properties? Like, so eating sounds, they all have a similar sort of wet sound to them, for example, or is it that they're joined together based on um, something about the meaning of the sound, like that it's eating behavior or that for throat, nose and throat things that it's illness related kind of sounds um, or environmental so we we don't know if it if those things group together because of the acoustic properties of the sound or if it's um something to do with the meaning of the sound but yeah i, I ask one of the neuroscience people they might be able to help you with that one <laughs> i think there are a few people that are studying that if you look in the resource sensor, uh, center, some of those papers might be there. If not, if you look on the So Quiet website, mostly all of the papers that have been done are there. And I know, um, I think Heather Hansen was working on a, a database of sounds, so she might be able to give some more information about that as well. She's talking later today. We're at five minutes. Okay, 
Thank you. Uh, one more, maybe we can take one or two more questions. So have you done or are planning to do a level chart with those ones that have clinical misophonia? I guess severity is what. Sorry, I'm not understanding the question. A level chart? A level chart. Let's see. I, I wonder, I think this person is talking about different levels of severity with the people who have who are you thought had clinical misophonia mm -hmm. i'm i'm not sure if i'm understanding the question but one one thing i'm doing in the study that i'm doing later this year is going to be using that uh, the the study that i referenced at the end there the us based study that um, used a screening tool to separate people into clinical and subclinical misophonia or no misophonia. I'm going to use that to then compare those three different groups on lots of different aspects, both of misophonia and also of, of things like depression and anxiety and, and general sort of emotion processes to see what the differences are. And, and it could be that there are some things that are really similar in subclinical and clinical misophonia that's really different in no misophonia. And there might be other aspects that only exist in clinical misophonia. And that's something that I'm really interested in finding out. And the implications for that in terms of treatment are really, really important because there might be some general processes that could be helped with therapy that are contributing to misophonia or exacerbating misophonia. So that's, yeah, that's something I'm interested in. But if I've misunderstood the question, please just add a little extra comment in, um, yeah. Okay, this is going to be our last question, Dr. Gregory. Personally, I have exceptional hearing, but not hyperacusis. I find very loud and all encompassing sound like music relieving for my misophonia. Do others have this experience? Um, um, yes, <laughs> some people do, some people don't. Some people find loud music overwhelming and overstimulating and too much. Other people find it soothing and kind of a relief from misophonia. It's interesting, that question. I don't know if anyone from um, the Concordia University team is talking today, but that idea of exceptional hearing, which I've heard from quite a few people, but they did a st study at Concordia University that was, they, f they found that in terms of detecting the sounds, people with and without misophonia, there wasn't much difference, but we're probably more alert to the sound. So our attention is kind of ready for sounds rather than it actually being a difference in hearing. But I have certainly heard that some people saying that they've got really good hearing and I can hear a tap dripping from across the room like that my husband hasn't even noticed. He'll be baffled at how I, how I heard it. Thank you so much, Dr. Gregory. That was a wonderful presentation. And thank you all for asking such terrific questions. And I think we're ending just on time. Anything you'd like to say, Dr. Gregory, before no, we No, just, um, yeah, keep supporting research. The, the misophonia community has been so generous with their time. I'm really grateful that I now have research funding so I can actually pay participants to um, their time in research. But early on, we didn't have any funding and we were so grateful of how many people donated a lot of their time and wisdom to help us do this research. So if any of you are out there who took part, thank you. We seem to have lost Jennifer. So I guess I will yeah. wrap this up. <laughs> we'll head over to the next one. Thanks, Jane. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Bye, everyone. Thank you.